Hi there, everyone. Welcome to Cold Ones for Caregivers. I'm Kyle Woody, founder and executive director of Jack's Caregiver Coalition, where our mission is to improve the way that guys think, feel, and act in their role as a cancer caregiver. On behalf of our entire campaign team, we're so grateful you're here with us today. And I'm excited that in a moment, I get to introduce to you our final campaign honoree, Mr. Tom Scott. But before I do that, let me give you a quick, quick update on how our campaign is going. Um, first, I want to thank our sponsors. They made it possible. At the gold level, Gephardt Electric and Northland Concrete and Masonry. And at the silver level, Minnesota Oncology, Paint, Pate Bonding Incorporated, Transparent Financial, Alina Health, Virginia Piper Cancer Institute, and WSB. Again, sponsors, thank you all for making this possible. Our goal with Cold Ones for Caregivers is to raise $30,000. That's enough to make 40 more stories of caregiver support like Tom's possible. Our main event for the campaign is tomorrow, Saturday the 12th of September at 612 Brewery in Minneapolis from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. It's a virtual hybrid program, so if you aren't comfortable joining us in person, uh, you can join us from the safety of your home, or you can come out and join us at the brewery. Uh, hopefully we'll have great weather and we can all be outside and feel safe. Um, yeah, so, and then so far, we've raised $11,445. As of the time of this recording, that's 38% of our goal. And that leaves us with 62% of the way to go. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and we need your help now, uh, as there are only four days left in the campaign. It'll be closing Monday, September 14th. So how can you help? There are three ways. First, go to jackscaregiverco.org forward slash cold ones for caregivers. That's our main campaign page. And there you can become a fundraiser. And when you do, uh, you'll receive right away uh, this cool lapel pin. Um, and then you can also earn, uh, based on how much uh, you're able to raise, cool gifts like this sweater I have on. The weather's gotten a little colder and it's sweater weather, so you might uh, have fun with that and, and lots of other stuff too. Um, and I want to mention our fundraisers so far, Allison Breininger, Mark Matson, Patty Jo Verdeja, Riley Moore, and Bree Ostrom have already set up their fundraising pages. And uh, so far, Patty Jo Verteja is still in the lead. Way to go, Patty Jo. And another thing you can simply do there is make a donation. Every dollar helps us. And for every $750 we raise, we're able to support a caregiver like Tom for an entire year. Um, so we need your help and we appreciate it. And we appreciate everyone who's already helped us raise the money we've raised so far. Um, and then the third thing you can do there is uh, some fun things we just added. We launched the silent auction, is open and running on the site, and you can also buy beer wall tickets. So uh, cold ones uh, for caregivers, buy beer wall tickets, and, um, and we're at a brewery, so a lot of fun. And so with that, I am, well, I am excited to welcome to the program our final honoree for this campaign, Mr. Tom Scott. Tom, hey, look at you. You got the spotlight on you. How does that? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, why not? Technology these days. Yeah, we're in, we're in quarantine. We're COVID and uh, we're just, we're going to do it however we can. We're so excited to have you here with us, Tom, and, and for allowing us to tell your story. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction. Uh, Tom is a guy with way better things to do than check his mail. He is first and foremost a dad to his six-year-old son Emmett and his four-year-old daughter Mia. And on April 8th, 2020, he lost his lovely bride, Danny, after a three-year battle with cancer. Uh, first of all, Tom, we're so sorry for your loss um, and just so grateful for you 
to share your time with us and and your story um, with our with our with our supporters. And you know, I'll kick. I'll just go right in into the questions, and and I'll mention at the top of this that we are releasing uh, more of Tom's you know, deeper dive into Tom's story through a blog and through a podcast in the weeks ahead. Uh, this program will be uh, much shorter, uh, but for those of you that are really intrigued and want to learn more, there will be more uh, coming your way. But recently, Tom, when I asked you about what our mission meant to you, one of you said a lot of things, but one of the things you said was, well, my wife's cancer had moved to her brain and she was losing control of the left side of her body. And I basically had to carry her. I had to carry her to the bathroom and like I had to carry her everywhere. And to have another person in that meeting that went through that and understood that was a pretty powerful thing. And so a question I have about that statement or so, a series of questions are, are, what are the outcomes of connections like that? You know, like you say, it's powerful, but but why? Um, and you know, and I was thinking, like, is it is it tangible stuff? Like you learned something that you you know a strategy that you were able to employ that was like uh, helpful moving forward, or or was it just more simply about just finding solace and and you know realizing you weren't the only one going through that and meeting someone else? Yeah, well, um, I guess it was a little bit of everything. You know, when you get married, you know, you meet that bride, you get married, you share everything, right? You talk about your day and you talk about your hopes and your dreams and your goals. And when you're battling cancer, especially once it, you know, it went from started as breast cancer and once it moves to the lungs and the liver and the bones and the brain, you know the inevitable is going to happen, right? You know that there's only one outcome. But I couldn't talk to her about that, right? I mean, you can't. Her, her problems of dealing with cancer was way different than my problems of dealing with cancer. And it wasn't fair for me to talk about my frustrations of losing her because she was dealing with her frustrations of having to say goodbye. So to go to Jax and talk to other guys that, you know, that are in the same shoes uh, was, it was nice to have, we didn't solve anything, right? We didn't come up with any solutions or, right? We're guys and we want to fix stuff, but you can't. Uh, it, but it was nice to just know that you know, this was a normal, normal thing, I guess. That, I guess it's not really normal, but to meet somebody else that went through that and to to share that emotion of just that helplessness of not being able to fix something was, it helped a lot, it, even though it solved nothing. Right. <clears throat> That's very well said. I think, um, you know, helping without solving, that's kind of a, that's a foreign concept to a lot of guys, right? Like, like you, haven't right. Solved, you haven't helped, and um, but these oftentimes are unsolvable problems, right? If 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 they were solvable, we, somebody somewhere would have figured this out and and had a cure, um, but but that isn't the case, and so yeah, um, that's and I and I also want to just echo what you said about the loved one that that our caregivers are caring for um there's only a so much we feel like we can really um share you know it's limited right like like we feel first and foremost our role is to inspire that person to give them hope to give them energy and enthusiasm and be their biggest cheerleader because they're going through something that's tragic beyond imagination, and and so it, it's really hard, right, to to come clean sometime on on how how you're really feeling, and um, and so this having another place 
somewhere else is really is what's needed. And I imagine when you when you were able to to find you know and this was a tremendous success story. This doesn't happen at every program that you were able to immediately connect with someone who had been through maybe not exactly the same thing, but super close, right? Like super close. Um, uh, so that's a great story. Uh, another thing you said uh, to that question was, that, again, the question being what our mission meant to you. You said, quote, I, I got asked a lot, how are you doing? And how are the kids? And in your mind, uh, you're like, I couldn't possibly answer that question truthfully because you wouldn't get it. You know, how could you? Um, you get those questions from one of the Jacks guys and well, here it is, you know, you could give them a real answer and they get it. They understand it. Yeah, it's powerful. Um, so a question that came to mind as I as I thought about your statement was, do you think it takes an organization like Jack's to create those spaces where where these real answers are given? You know, like can't 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 we just do it on our own? Like why why isn't why is an organization like Jack's re required or is it? Um, and and why was telling your truth and having having it understood important? Um, and again, what were the outcomes of that or for, for you? What were the outcomes? Sure. So it's a multi-part question again. <laughs> Start where well, we you know, so a buddy stops by, hey, let's have a beer in the garage, you know, how you doing? Yeah. And the reality of it is their problem, their biggest problem that particular day was, you know, the traffic or it rained out or it was too hot or it was too cold, right? I mean, they just don't, that's their big problem of the day. And the reality, you know, when she was, especially once she entered hospice and all that, I mean, who wants to, hear, how do you tell your buddy, oh, I haven't slept in four days, you know, I'm up every, every hour changing bedding because the catheter leaked or, you know, taking her to the bathroom is a two hour ordeal or, you know, just to, we live in a three level house and the shower's upstairs, you know, so to bring her upstairs to give her a bath is a whole day. I mean, you got to plan for it. I mean, it takes all day. So how do you normal people just don't understand how difficult that is to on so many levels right the physical exhaustion of being up all the time going to work taking care of kids taking care of the house on top of the emotional side of it of being completely helpless and knowing what's happening and so you know to go to jacks and talk to other guys that you really you almost don't even have to tell your story. All you have to do is just give a blurb of it and they know exactly what you're talking about, where you're coming from, because they've been through it. And then you ask the question, well, why can't you just talk to, why couldn't you just talk to another caregiver? Well, I guess if you happen to know one that you could connect with on your own, odds are that you're probably an acquaintance of some sort. And so, again, can you be truthful in your story, right? Because they already know your story and know you at an emotional, you know, personal level. So can you really be honest with them? Right. So I don't know. It's kind of weird. And with that said, so after my wife had died, uh, my neighbor put me in touch with a friend of hers who had lost her husband to cancer just a few months earlier. And it was kind of funny looking back now, it, you know, it's been a few months and looking back at that whole ordeal and what we talked about and why would they put us in touch with one another and all these things. It's almost as though normal people don't want to talk to us caregivers or widowers, because they don't want us to get our sadness on them. So here, here's somebody else that's been through what you've been through. Go talk to them about it. You know, yeah. people just, 
it's deep stuff and it's i remember um you know when she was in her hospital bed and living in the living room and we we're talking about you know what is life going to look like for me after she's gone how am i going to raise the kids what am i going to do and um it was real easy to lay there next to her and have this idea of what life was going to be but once she's gone it changes it's completely different and so and i say that because it's really easy for normal people to look at my life or what i do and to think you know as they lay in bed next to their spouse well, I can't believe Tom's doing this or good job that he's doing that. And it's different because they have their person. You know, once that person's, it's really strange. And I say that because I had a friend of mine uh, years ago who lost her husband to cancer. And I remember not long, maybe a couple years afterwards, she had met another guy and started dating and eventually got married. And I remember thinking to myself, like, how could you remarry so quickly? How could you date so quickly? Like you, you had this commitment, you had vows, you got married. How could you do that? Right. And I didn't say anything to her, but I remember having those negative thoughts in judgment on her. And now having gone through it, I just feel awful that I even thought those things. Right. And so, yeah, I think the whole Jack's thing and talking to people that have been there that get it is, um, you know, that don't know you on a personal level necessarily is really, it's a great thing. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, that's never occurred to me until now that, you know, part of the power, I think, is that is that oftentimes we don't know one another and we wouldn't have met under under different circumstances right like a lot of these people you would have never come into contact with um because they don't live in your part of town they don't go to your church or they're not you know they're not in your circles and and that is perhaps really important because you don't bring any of your of your history to those folks or their preconceived notions about you and and what you have or haven't done in the past, right? You you can just come and, and be be yourself <laughs> almost easier because you don't know them. Um, and I think that that's, I don't know, that's just something that's never occurred to me until as you were explaining it. Um, and, you know, how would, how would you meet these people otherwise? Um, and, and good, you know, I hear you about about your friend who introduced you to the other friend and and yeah it's I don't know if it's that they they're avoiding our sadness but I think it's just awkward for them you know they don't they acknowledge that there's no way they can understand what you've been through because they haven't been through it and and oh but I I know someone you know and that's a lot of times how we find out about caregivers is is people know about jacks that aren't caregivers and as soon as they hear about someone that is they say this is where you need to go um, i can't help you but but these folks can and so <clears throat> thank you uh, for sharing that tom i'm going to quick uh remind everybody why we're here um we're we are our goal is to make 40 more stories of support like tom's a real and, and that's gonna take $30,000. Um, our main event is September 12th at 612 Brewery in Minneapolis. Again, it's virtual. You guys can join us online. You can join us, or it's, it's hybrid, I should say. Join us online, join us at the brewery. Join us at the brewery online if you want. Just get on your phone, and, but also be there. Um, go to jackscaregiverco.org forward slash cold ones for caregivers. And there you can fundraise for our campaign. You can donate to our campaign. Every dollar helps, every single dollar. And for every 750 we raise, we're able to support a caregiver for an entire year with our programming. And then uh, fun stuff is to bid on the silent auction, which is open now. 
um, and buy beer wall tickets. So you can win a big wall of beer. And so, and I'll, I'll also mention uh, that another thing we'll do there is give away the Caregiver Cup, which is an annual award uh, we give to the caregiver that we believe brought the best to the challenge and uh, exhibited our core values of compassion, courage, resilience, and respect. And that trophy I just happen to have right here, uh, the Caregiver Cup, you can see the past winners um, there. Every year we etch a new name into the trophy. And already this year, we have uh, three nominees, Dan Kramer. We have uh, Mike McGarry and Doug Dahlman. So that'll be another fun thing on Saturday that you can see is uh, the presentation of that award. So back to you, Tom. Um, a final question. I wonder about the we we've coined the phrase care getter. So so the person receiving the care, uh, the Dannys of the world. Um, I wonder if they're, you know, does serve it. You know, Jack's message was serve the caregiver. They're always forgotten. And, and so that message, that service that, you know, that is central to our mission, do you, can you draw any connection to, to the care getter? You know, like, do you think there's any impact? We, we know there's an impact to the caregiver, right? Like you feel better, you have better ideas, uh, your experience is improved. I think for most, like 97% of those we've served, we can, we can demonstrate that, but it's a little harder to, to talk about what might be uh, the impact to the care getter. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I do remember that when I started going to Jack's, I mean, Danny was pretty, she made sure that I always went, that I didn't miss a meeting. And I mean, she's seen that, that it helped. I mean, it didn't, I don't ever remember solving a problem. Hey, what's this tip or what's this trick or how do we fix cancer? Right. I mean, there's none of that. Right. And you know, we also don't just sit around in a circle and mope and cry and be sad and talk about our feelings, but I guess in a way we do, but I know that I always walked away feeling better knowing that, uh, there's other people out there that are going through it. Uh, maybe taking a way, a uh, situation that you look at negatively and now you found a positive way to spin it and, in, and embrace it. So I do know that she made sure that I went because she could see a change in my attitude for a little bit of time afterwards, you know? So yeah, I mean, they, they get a lot out of it as well. Yeah. And that's, cool. that's important. I mean, I, I think, um, uh, I've read and I can't I can't say this is true or not. You know, you read things in a book and and it's it may or may not be true. Um, but but I've read that one of the primary worries that the folks facing cancer have is the person caring for them. You know, they and oftentimes when it's guys, we because we hear a lot from from the ladies in their lives like I'm worried about him. You know, he's not himself he's grumpy <laughs> he's uh you know seems depressed and um and they they know they know their guy like they can sense things that oftentimes you know in my own story i didn't know that something was wrong with me like all i knew was something's wrong with her <laughs> and, yeah. and i needed her to point that out for me yeah, so, I didn't realize how depressed and angry I was, especially towards the end, until about a month or two after she died. You know, once once that grief kind of settles, the funeral's done, the cards stop coming, and you start seeing the light again and enjoying life and smiling a little bit more. 
looking, I had no idea how depressed I was until that started happening. So, yeah. I mean, the heck you said it like it was hectic. Right. And, and I, I think that that's part of the, the trap is it's so hectic. And so, you know, you don't have time to even realize how, how you're feeling. You're just, you're getting, you're getting shit done. And yeah. <laughs> and so it takes sometimes the people in our lives to, to kind of say, Hey, you know, like Danny did reminder, you know, you need to go to this clutch and, and, and I want you to do that. And it's important. And maybe just to clarify for the people that aren't caregivers that are watching this. Yeah. Caring for my wife and taking care of her. I took a lot of pride in that. I enjoyed that. I love that. I was able to do that for her. And that's not the thing that stressed me out. The thing that stressed me out was the emotion side behind it of watching her die and mm -hmm. not being able to do anything about it other than, you know, cook her her favorite meals or get her, her favorite ice cream or, you know, give her an electric blanket. You know, the little things that you could do. I mean, that's that's it. But the caring for you know, I would go to a lot of these meetings and some people like, I don't know how to care for my wife. You know, they don't cook. The wife, you know, was the homemaker yeah. and they really struggled with that. And I'm thankful that I didn't have that. I didn't have that struggle just because I was the cook. I was the, you know, keep the kitchen clean. You know, I was that guy. I, that was my role in the household. So, um, but the emotion side of it, you just can't get away from. I mean, it's there. Right. You're, you're losing the, the love of your life. And um, yeah, I think that's important. And, and everyone's different, right? Like everyone that faces this challenge is there is no normal caregiver situation. They're they're all unique. Um, and, you know, it's and and you you i just in such a short time you made such an impact um on the people that that were there um and i just want to celebrate that and and thank you for for having the courage to to create the margin in your life that was needed to to engage with us because it, it wasn't just that it helped you um you helped the other folks in the room and you know that's what makes it work right like we don't stand in front of a group of caregivers and say you know some expert like this is this is how you do this and you know if you're if you're feeling sad do that and if you're feeling angry do this you know we just bring you you guys together and we let you guys be the magic but the the critical ingredient there is that caregivers take the time to show up and right now that's virtually which takes a little less time uh but back when you first came i think in january of this year um that was that was a much harder thing to do to, to say i'm i'm gonna clock out here for a while and and go do this thing um so just wanted to say kudos to you tom and and thank you for everything that you've done for our mission and and i hope that our mission can continue to serve you we we've started programming this year uh, which is living with loss and it's focused on our members who have unfortunately experienced the loss and um, we're excited that 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 offering is available and uh, for those that are dealing with now you know i i think you mentioned it somewhere along the way of the, the quietness that suddenly, you know, it's weird that there's no uh, oxygen tank buzzing anymore, right? Like I've heard caregivers say, like maybe the hardest thing was getting up that next morning and there was no caregiving to do. Like I got good at this, all these things, and now they're not required. I got laid off. And, and that's just a whole nother, 
whole nother thing. And um, so we're we're here for you for through that. And um, and also thank you for the Facebook stuff. You know, you've you've been very active there and very supportive just in your own uh, creative ways. Um, so I, if you can't tell everyone, I have a man crush on Tom. Um, <laughs> get, that right, get that right out there. Um, and so any parting words, Tom, before before we say goodbye? No, I'm looking forward to having a couple beers on Saturday. I, that's right. going to be great to be semi-social again, get out of this house and see my guys, you know? Amen. I'm hoping Amen. a lot of them make it. Yeah, let's let's hope for good weather and um, and just a, a great time uh, together and for a great cause. And again, thank you for joining us today, Tom. And in closing, um, uh, just a reminder: we will be releasing a, a spotlight blog uh, and a podcast featuring Tom in the weeks ahead. Uh, we'll dive much deeper into his story, and that'll all be featured on our Cold Ones for Caregivers campaign site. Um, and just to those watching, we're just we're overwhelmed with gratitude that you chose to spend your time with us today. We know there are plenty of a lot of things to do, um, and you chose to to visit us today. And so thank you for spending your time. Um, Again, the, the main event is September 12th, that's Saturday, 612 Brewery in Minneapolis from one to three. We'll have live music. The Burning Blue is the name of the band. We'll have a silent auction, which is already open, uh, but at the venue, you can see a lot of the things that are being auctioned off. We'll have more stories of caregiver support uh, and award ceremony. We'll award the most successful fundraisers. And then we will again give uh, this trophy behind me away to the Jack of the Year. And so look for that uh, online or in person at the venue. And, and finally, I just wanna thank everyone who's making this campaign possible. It's a team sport, just like caregiving is. And our co-chairs, Bree Ostrom and Patty Jo Verdeja, Marketing, Riley Moore, Silent Auction, Eva Verdeja, Virtual Production, Chris Cloutier, and Alan Christensen, and our volunteer coordinator, Pat Klein. Thank you, everybody. Have an awesome day.